Here's them, uh, those 24 thrones, those 24 elders. Here's a whole bunch of angels. The, the, this is not just yellow. These are all angels, if you can make them out. Here's the thrones with the elders. They're offering up. They have all have harps, and they're uh, offering up incense. And then here's this sea of glass out here in the center. We said that this, if you remember, we talked about the tabernacle, and the tabernacle had the holy of holies in the holy place. And so if this is the holy place, obviously it's, there's a holy place would be in heaven, right? And then the holy of holies, um, you can see here the, the this center place, and you can see these uh, pillars of fire, which correspond to the seven churches in, in Revelation. And then uh, if you see, I'm going to try to stretch up here and reach here. Right here you got the Lamb. And uh, the Lamb has in his hand a sealed book. And then above that you can see the four cherubim around that um, that circle at the, at, right there at the top of the center. That's the throne of God. There's an a emerald uh, bow around. When we think of a bow, like the rainbow, we think of kind of like a semicircle, right? But think about this. It's only a semicircle because it begins and ends at the earth, right? But actually, if there was no, if it, if there was no ground, the, the thing would be completely around. So this is, uh, and that's what the artist is trying to, uh, to demonstrate here that this, this, uh, bow of, of God's, um, of covenant goes, completely surrounds his throne there. So I, I think it's kind of awesome. We don't, we can't, uh, Oh, here's a crown. Remember, um, it says that the elders cast their crowns. There's a crown right there. So uh, uh, there's a thunder and lightning coming out from the throne there. So this kind of reminds us of some of the things that we've already spoken about. And I just bring this as a, as a remember, it's as a starting place. We're going to talk about uh, some things that you probably have never heard these things. I think it's... Uh, it's pretty awesome uh, what, uh, what we're going to speak about today. So we'll, we'll see how you like it. And you see here, we're reading in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. It says, um, you can notice in the picture, in the right hand, I know it's the right hand because the thumb is on this side, okay? The right hand is, ho- there's a right hand holding a scroll. Do you see it there in the picture? And it's handing the scroll off to another person's right hand. And it's Revelation chapter 5, 1 through 7 says this, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, uh, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon this throne. This uh, is setting us up for, um, for actually the, uh, the sixth chapter, because in the sixth chapter of Revelation is when uh, Jesus, being the Lamb of God, the Lamb saying, is going to open up that scroll, and everything that happens from the opening up that scroll is like all of the rest of the book of Revelation. He took, takes the seals off and all the judgments of God and all that prophetic truth, everything just begins happening and occurring. But first, there has to be someone that's able to open up that scroll. It's interesting that it's written on both sides because what that tells us is that this, this book, they didn't normally write on the outside. The only times they did that was in two times, whether if it, number one, if, if it was a title deed of some property or if it was a will, like a last will and testament. So 
This book has to be either or symbolically has to represent either a last will and testament or a, uh, a title deed to property, some sort of property, or both. Okay, so that's kind of a hint uh, looking uh, towards um, uh, what this uh, scroll looks like. We'll go more in depth on that next week. But I wanted to show you that the emphasis is upon this scroll and this book in his hand, uh, the one who was on the throne. There's also another book mentioned in the scripture. In Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, we read, Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked. And behold, a flying roll. You can see the prophet Zechariah is shown this vision. And here's this flying roll going across the heavens. And he sees this. So what is this? Obviously, oh, oh by the way, the, ro- the word roll is actually the same word as scroll. It always refers to a roll or a scroll of a, a book. Books in that time were not like we think about, where we have pages. Books were always scrolls. Up until about 200 A.D., I think it was, they started when when they started making um, uh, codex. They called them codex, where you had the actual pages on books. But before that, you had scrolls. Anyway, so he saw this scroll, but this was this gigantic scroll flying in the, across the heavens. And, uh, and the scripture in verse 2 says, And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying scroll or a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof is 10 cubits. The only question I would have for God is, What is a cubit? How many know what is a cubit? Okay, yeah, from here to here. But you can see the problem with that measurement, right? Because everybody's cubit is a little different. But, uh, yeah, so it's from here to here. So uh, they usually say about 18 inches or so. Uh, You know, they kind of take an average here. But uh, so this thing was um, uh, 20 cubits, so that would be 20 times 18. Uh, You could even say 20 uh, 20 inches, if you will. So maybe if it was a larger cubit, then so... uh, But that's a nice round number, 20 times 20. So that was 400 inches. I don't know what that would come down to in feet. And uh, it doesn't matter, though. And the breadth thereof uh, was 10 cubits. So it's 20 by 10, whatever. Then said he unto me, this is the... Now he's telling it, what what is this thing that he's witnessing? What is this large book, if you will, this large scroll that he sees in the heavens? He says, this I... uh, Said he unto me, this is the curse... That goes forth over the face of the whole earth. Did you know the problem with the law? How many heard of the word Torah? Okay, the Jews used to call their holy book the Torah. The Torah included two things. The covenant, right? The covenant which God was making covenant with with Israel so he could bring them into redemption so he could be their God and they could be his people. But also included was, it was, was the law. There was a whole set of rules. And if you broke the law, you were worthy of death. And so if you dis, disobeyed the law, you brought a curse upon yourself. So it is interesting. It could refer to the word of God in in a a disobedient world that absolutely refuses to obey God's word. And that would bring a curse going forth over the the face of the whole earth. In Isaiah uh, 34, 4, he he speaks of the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. He equates the heavens... As a scroll. In other words, just like Zechariah saw this scroll in the heaven, just like John sees a scroll in the hand of God in heaven, Isaiah said the heavens itself in, at one time in the future will be rolled together as a scroll. If you could, um, if you could just uh, uh, imagine that. In other words, he's likening it the heavens to a scroll. 
It's also repeated in the book of Revelation here, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. So we can see that book of Revelation is actually quoting Isaiah and likening the heaven as a scroll. This becomes important, especially when we think about this other scroll that Zechariah is seeing here. Um, I don't know how, how many are familiar with Revelation chapter 12, where it talks about this glorious woman who is clothed with the sun. We're going to look at her because you see across the top of the slide here, it says, upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. Okay, how does that fit in with the rest of the things we're talking about? Well, let's look at this. So in in Revelation 12, we're starting here. We're going to bounce over there in a minute. This is Revelation 12, 1 through 3. Over there is 12, 4, and 5. So, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of stars. So she's got a she's got a crown of 12 stars upon her head. What do we think or what what do you uh what have you heard that the uh this crown of 12 stars represents on the head of this woman? Anybody? Twelve Pardon? The 12 tribes. Okay, and in and, and your most of your commentators will say that it represents the 12 tribes of Israel. There were 12 tribes of, uh, 12 sons of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel. And so I, I also think, uh, that, uh, that's right on target, that the 12 stars, this woman actually represents the nation Israel, uh, uh prophetically, and, uh, she has upon her head these 12 stars a, as a crown, and she's going to have a, a baby, and of course, If we're talking about Israel and we're talking about this child, I think we're going to pretty well guess who this child is. But let's look at uh, the next verse here. And she being with child, and uh, if you can look up here, her belly's a little big. Some pictures, the belly's even bigger. But this one says, she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. That's the evil one. If you don't know, the dragon is the evil one, okay? And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for her, to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Who do we think that child might represent? How about Jesus, the Messiah, or the Christ, the Christos? How many ever heard that word, the Christos, the Christ, Son of the living God? And that's exactly it, because there's only one who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. We talked about the, the millennial kingdom. Millenn- In fact, one, one week we, we came and we talked, right? About, uh, we spent the whole night talking about the thousand-year millennial kingdom and where Jesus would actually physically rule from the land of Israel and during that thousand-year period after he, uh, after he returns. So... I come here because I want you to I want you to kind of link what's uh, we want, we're going to tie all this together, and uh, you'll see why in a, in a little while here. But this this actually this is kind of a strange uh, a strange scripture, and it really kind of tells the whole story of of uh, what we're facing here upon this earth. Because the whole story, really the whole Bible is concerned about the child coming forth, being caught up to the throne, the enemy trying to devour the child as soon as it was born. Now, I've said it at different times that the child not only represents Christ rising to heaven, but also 
If we are in Christ as the body of Christ, we're in that child coming up to heaven. That means that the, the, the dragon's also there trying to devour us as soon as we are born. And so this really tells the whole story right here in picture form about what's going on. And of course, those 12 stars, it talks about the whole foundation, if you will, of uh, of of Christianity and Judaism because everything is based upon the Old Testament first and then the New Testament or you could even reverse that because the apostles have ever all actually been placed first now because if you look at the holy city that their names are upon the 12 foundations of the holy city the gates still have the names of the 12 tribes of Israel this uh, this woman by the way, uh, if, if, how many have seen the uh, statues of Mary where they have the 12 stars around her head? See, what, what's happened here is that the Catholicism has misappropriated this story and this picture and made an image to worship a, a goddess and, and even call her the queen of heaven. And they put the 12 stars around her feet. And and that that dragon that stands there ready to devour her, they have her with her foot crushing the head of the serpent, which is actually what the Messiah is supposed to do, elevating her to the place of deliverer. But that's not what it means. All the false religion... And all the false teaching, and especially teaching of astrology and horoscopes and, th- and, and mythology and all these gods and goddesses, all of it is a corruption by Nimrod and his wife Semiramis and his son Tammuz. It all centers around that, and they were the founders of Babylon. Just like Semiramis confounded and corrupted the teachings back then of the stars and, and led people to worship the stars as goddesses and gods, just like that, that's what Catholicism did when they corrupted this scripture. Just so you, so you understand uh, uh, what's going on today. Okay, religion was the first area of Satan's attack as far as uh, his dealing with mankind. He sought to pull people away from God, and it pretty much starts out, and this is right after the flood. We're not talking about the time before the flood, but right after the flood, there's this guy that appears on the scene, Nimrod. And Nimrod establishes a a mystery religion in Babylon. And you'll remember, this is is shortly after the flood, and the people were of one language and one tongue, if you'll remember from your biblical history. And there was a tower that he urged them to build to reach unto heaven, the scripture says. Now, we don't know exactly what that meant. I always thought it was kind of foolish that anyone would think that they could build a tower to get all the way to heaven. I have read that uh, uh, there's theories that there was the zodiac on top of the temple and that was the heaven that they were talking about and it was a means to lead people into worship. I don't know. I, I only know what the scripture says and the scripture does say, he was trying, they, they were trying to build this tower to reach to heaven. When uh, God saw their intent uh, and the extent of their idolatry, he destroyed their tower and he confounded their speech. You remember that from Genesis chapter 11, verse 1 through 9. Now, a lot of people wonder, well, how did he do that? The word of God says they spoke with one language and then boom, they didn't speak in one language anymore. How do, how, do we, how do we account for that? I don't know. Maybe he just tweaks something in their brain. I don't know how God did it. God is God. And oh, there is nothing impossible for God to do. So it really doesn't matter how. And, and I think the, uh, the miracle came in reverse in the day of Acts when the Holy Spirit came back upon us and they all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This person, Nimrod, is mentioned in your Bible as the son of Cush, who was the son of Ham, who was the son of Noah. Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. The name Nimrod actually means we shall rebel, which is interesting. 
Uh, one, uh, one side note, as, you're going, as you read your scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, especially Old Testament, the names have great significance and sometimes prophetic meaning to them. They didn't just haphazardly look in uh, the baby book and say, I'm going to name my baby whatever. They chose a name because that's what they wanted this child to be. Or God had revealed, name this child this name. We don't do that today. We, we, uh, most of us have gone, especially this United States culture. Nimrod is described in chapter 10 of Genesis, verse 8, as a mighty one on the earth and a mighty hunter. I believe it says a mighty hunter against God. He built eight cities in the ancient world, including Babel. You'll find that in verses 10 through 12. The Hebrew historian Flavius Josephus, who was around in the time of Jesus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, depicts Nimrod as a tyrannical leader demanding complete dominion and control over the people. The eight cities named in the Bible are Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kelne, all in the land of Shinar. And Shinar is just another name for Babylon. And also Nineveh, Rehoboth, and Kala, and all of those were, uh, were built in the land of Assyria, is what that's saying. But they were all, so, so when you think of Nimrod, you think of the one who, who first built all these great cities and took dominion over the people after the time, after Noah's flood. And he built these eight large cities, half of them in the land of Shinar or Babylon, and half of them in the land of Assyria. After the death of this Nimrod character, his wife, Anne slash mother, because when you start looking at the history, it's, it gets all confused, and we'll see why in a minute. Uh, her name was Semiramis, and she proclaimed him to be a god. And he became known as the sun god. He was called Bel, and this sun god was nothing more than the representation of Satan. And this is really the beginning of the apostasy in this earth after the time of Noah. And if you look now at the PowerPoint, you'll see that the same sun god is is worshipped throughout many different lands under many different names. We have Apollo, Bel, Mithra, Jupiter, Marduk, Osiris, Ra, Helios. You see Helios, it looks like the sun. You see the rays coming out of his head. All of these are representations of the sun god. Jupiter, of course, was, uh, was a Roman. Osiris and Ra were both Egyptian. Mithra came from uh, uh, Persia. And Marduk was uh, uh, in the uh, ancient uh, Mesopotamia re- region. Uh, he would have been uh, in the days of a- uh, Uh, popularly worshipped in the days of Abraham. Apollo was Greek. And uh, Bel, uh, I think he was in in the land of Persia as well. But there, these are not, it's not, this is not all inclusive here. There are many, many, many names by which this God was worshipped. And also his wife and his son. Now, Moses warned against sun worship. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, 19, he said, Lest thou lift up thy eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them. And also, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, we read, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is under the earth. And this is from the Ten Commandments. You notice what I have in red there. Thou shalt not make uh, unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything. Now, there are churches calling themselves by the name of Christ, and they make images very freely and they bow down and they serve them and they say well that's not idolatry my bible tells me and the spirit of god tells me that is idolatry that's exactly what he was talking about and some of the things that we'll see later on if they wouldn't do this they wouldn't be in the trouble that they're in following after these spirits that are misleading them but they did not pay attention to the scripture and the warning just like israel of old now back to this Nimrod. Nimrod was the, the, the husband. Semiramis was the wife. Nimrod started this false religion, which is later called and referred to in, in history as Babylonian mystery religion. 
He took as his personal emblem the symbol of the snake or serpent or dragon. Remember, they said that Nimrod was, was actually the sun god, and the sun god was actually a representation of Satan. When Nimrod eventually died, his religion continued on. His wife, the queen, Samaramis, saw to it, and she deified <clears throat> Nimrod, her dead husband, as the sun god, the god of the sun and the father of all creation. Samaramis had a problem. The law of the land prevented a woman from ruling. She apparently wanted to continue as queen, so she came up with a plan. No woman may reign over, this is the, what the law said, no woman may reign over the uh, sons of Asher. We only owe allegiance to a king. It is our privilege and our law. Well, Samaramis had to do something about that. According to 10 verse 11, Nimrod was the Ninus of, or Ninus of Assyria. Now, it doesn't say Ninus, but we know from history that the, the, the one who built Assyria, who founded Assyria, was called in the Assyrian historical records by the name Ninus. He's none other than this same Nimrod. And these historical records also show that he was murdered by his wife, Samaramis. Oh, that's kind of interesting. His body was afterward cut into pieces and scattered around the country among his worshipers. And after the death of Ninus, or Ninus, or Ninus, or however it's pronounced, Samaramis is said to have erected to him a temple tomb near Babylon. Speculations support that Ninus was threatening his wife, which led to her murder of him. We don't know what the threatening was of, but it is very interesting that about nine months later, she had a child. And his name, she named him Tammuz. This is history of what happened between this, this Nimrod, or Ninus, and his wife Semiramis, and how this false religion... We know he's the, the author of these cities and the false religion, the false religious systems, and this is historically how this came into existence. Ninus is the name of the, of the king who founded Assyria and built the Assyrian, those Assyrian cities, and we, the Bible says Nimrod did, so they're one and the same. And from the, his, the, those Assyrian records, we find out that this happened. And so we equate Ninus with Nimrod, and we found, find out, well, how did he establish these false religions? Well, the Semiramis proclaimed that this new son, Tammuz, was the supernatural rebirth of her husband, Nimrod, who was Ninus. Ninus. Apparently, through trickery on her part, Semiramis was able to persuade Nimrod to grant her the rule of the kingdom for five days. That's according to this historical record. Now, in power, when she was in power, with the assistance of her co-conspirators, she was able to have him put to death. The death, burial, and resurrection, now this is a historical custom throughout the, uh, throughout the world that was uh, practiced by the kings or kings of various uh, uh, lands. The death, burial, and resurrection was a predominant custom throughout many of the ancient nations, and it was likely that Nimrod thought he was going along with a scheme to pretend to die and be resurrected, not being aware of his, the conspiracy. What you'll find out when you study some of these ancient civilizations, they used to do this like once a year. The king would pretend to die. They would have this festival, and he would pretend to die, and then he would come out of a cave and proclaim that he had been resurrected from the dead. What, what this Semiramis did is she actually had him killed. Well, he couldn't come back from the dead. And then when she had this child, she said it was supernaturally her husband back from the dead. And that's why we saw earlier, said his wife slash uh, mother. Because she claimed that she was not only the wife of this husband that she claimed was God, but now her son was this God reincarnated back into her son. And that's where really where you get this the doctrine of reincarnation, the beginning of the concept of reincarnation, where you die and you come back as a little child. And then you die and you come back as a little child. So all this began back in that time period. <clears throat> Crucifixion, historically, has been credited by many historians as having been devised in ancient Babylon and Assyria. And Samaramis is especially credited for inventing this form of execution. Now, its key word here is execution because, according to the history, she actually had her husband executed. Now, he did, he fell for the, he fell for her scheme. And the conspirators were working with her, they actually put him to death. Well, once he was dead, of course, he wasn't a god, so he couldn't rise from the dead, so he couldn't do anything about it. So, and he had changed the law that she would be in charge. Remember, she had, they had, she had to have that law altered. So he altered it for five days 
so she could be in charge while they staged this phony uh, execution and, and, or this, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. But he thought he was coming out and to assume his kingdom. Now, Semiramis had to convince the people that the death of Nimrod, her husband, was divinely inspired, that his death was to somehow be for the good of humanity and as a kind of atonement for sins. So the custom, this is the custom of the stage death, the burial and resurrection has been recorded in various ancient kingdoms, and you can find it throughout history. Now, later when Semiramis, the, and remember, the whole point here is to find out how did all of these false religious systems come about? Later, when Semiramis, the adulterous woman, gave birth to her illegitimate son, she claimed that the son Tammuz, by name, was Nimrod reborn, which we just said. Now, it's very coincidental that Tammuz's birthday was December 25th on Christmas, what we call Christmas, and she claimed that her son was supernaturally conceived and that he was promised the promised seed promised by God, Genesis 3.15, which shows that they were aware of the teaching of Genesis 3.15 that God was going to send his divine son, his incarnated son, into the world to redeem mankind. They were aware of that all the way back in the days preceding Noah. And she knew that and she claimed that this seed, this child, was that promised seed and that he should be worshipped as the son of God. Not only was this child worshipped, then as this incarnated God come from, from a supernatural birth, and some say it was a virgin birth later on, but this mother was also worshipped and became worshipped more than the son. And they call this a mother-child cult. Now, you can see the parallels with Christianity, and you can see what, what Satan is trying to do here. For when the truth comes... People will question, well, isn't this the same thing that we had in Babylon and in this mother and this child and this? And you can see how he's trying to uh, to bring this deception into the world. She became known as the goddess of the of the moon, the fertility, the mother goddess and the queen of heaven. And this mother child uh, father trio was also called the Trinity. Now, of course, they're what we can would say is the false Trinity. And you'll remember Satan said, I will be like God. I will be like the Most High. One thing I discovered is that Satan, if you want to know how Satan operates, look in the scripture and find out what God did. If you want to know what the Antichrist is going to do, find out what Jesus did. He's the Antichrist. He's called Antichrist for a reason. He's going to do the opposite of what Christ did. It is interesting to note that the Catholic Church often refers to Mary as the Queen of Heaven. How many know that? She's also seen many times with a child in her arms, which is a crazy doctrine if you think of it, because Jesus, even if it was represented that that was his mother and he was the child, he's a big man. He's 33 years old. He's not that little baby. My mother's Catholic church used to have the statues where they had Joseph and Mary and little Jesus, and he was about that tall. Well, that really comes from one of the apparitions. The Bible uh, never lifts Mary to a position of the queen of heaven. This is false doctrine. In fact, it states that she is blessed among women, and notice it does not say she's blessed among men. She says blessed among women. The Bible never attributes feminine characteristics to any supernatural beings, angels or demons, and the idea for a female deity is from Satan. We are never told that we're supposed to worship this queen of heaven. The mother with the child clearly is indicated in the ancient Egyptian zodiac of Dendera showing Virgo with her lap, her child in the lap. This comes right out of the, the zodiac, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the zodiac, ancient zodiac of Dendera. This indicates that uh, the antiquity of belief predated Christianity and the mother's son worship, the queen of heaven and divine sun god, is prominent throughout the ancient nations. Now, here's a list. And again, it's not... It doesn't include them all, but you'll see here in Asia, the goddess was worshipped. The goddess Sibel was worshipped, and her, the name of her child was Deoius. In uh, Babylon, it was Semiramis and Tammuz. That should be an, a Z at the end. Tammuz was the uh, child. In China, you have Shingmo, the, which is called the Holy Mother, and she has a little baby child in her arms. 
Uh, the Druids also had this virgin mother and child. In Egypt, you had Isis, the mother of God, and Horus was her child. In Ephesus, you had Diana, which is the goddess of virginity, and she was also considered the goddess of motherhood. In Germany, you had the virgin Hiratha, and she was portrayed with a child in her arms. And the Greeks had Aphrodite or Ceres, uh, Ceres and she had a child in her arms. India, you have... Uh, you actually have several in, in, in Drania with a child in her arms. You have Issi, which is considered the great goddess, and her child's name was Iswara. You have Devaki, and her child was Krishna. You probably heard of Krishna. In Rome, you had Venus or Fortuna, and her child was Jupiter. In Scandinavia, you had Disa, and she was, had a child in her arms. And uh, in the land of Sumeria, you had this Nana, and she was considered to be the mother of the child and the goddess of heaven. What has happened in Christianity? If you'll notice, Jesus is the Son of God. We were never told by the Scripture to worship the mother. We were never told she was the Queen of Heaven. We were never told in Scripture that she is a co-redeemer with Christ. We were never told to listen to her when she appears and speaks to us and do what she says. In fact, we were told in caution that Satan himself can appear like an angel of light to deceive people. And what we see here is that all the way through from the time of Babylon recorded in all of the history books and all of the ancient nations was this mother and child worship. Mother and child, mother and child, and mother and child. In the book of Revelation, we find in the last days, we see a woman seated on top of the beast with seven heads. And it says that she rules. She basically rules. She's in control of this beast who is the ruler over all of the earth. Because you know, if you're riding a horse, who's in control? The rider on the horse. If the rider on the horse is not in control, he's in a lot of trouble, right? She's Pivot, she's put on the seat of this beast, and the beast ru- rules over the earth. Well, how does he do it? In conjunction with this personage that is seated over all of the water, or over all many nations. If you'll look at the nations of the earth, still to this day, they are worshiping a female goddess who appears and proclaims herself to be father of this divine son and appears in apparitions to to get people to follow after her and to bow down and to serve her. They've made statues of her. Uh, One, uh, I don't know if if, uh, you've ever had the, I don't know if it's a privilege or not. I used to work in a a children's, uh, a Catholic children's home and I had the keys to the chapel and I would go in there on my break and I went in there, and I was, uh, I don't know what it was, but I was kind of, I, was, I looked at the, the, the statue of Joseph, and there was a statue of Mary, and I'm, I was like, how do people, I couldn't understand, how do people get so hooked up into this? And I, I got down by Joseph, and I kind of went like this, and I was looking up, and I'm like, this is, this is a block of wood. And I went over to the statue of Mary, and I looked up like this, and I had this, and this is before I knew any, I just had like this, ooh, like this darkness, this, this coldness, and this, it was almost like a fear coming over. And I looked in her eyes, and the eyes looked almost human. Now, I'm not saying they were human eyes, but the way they made this statue was very, it was like, ma- uh, like a magnet pulling and pulling. And if you are not born again, filled with the Spirit, if you do not know the Word, it is no mystery to me that people are pulled and drawn to this, especially if you find out that all throughout the nations, men have been following after, men and women have been following after worshiping this mother goddess, the queen of heaven. And what do we have misleading people today? We have this same mother-child cult. No, it has nothing to do with negative about Jesus. Jesus is the son of the true son of God. And it's not a it's not something against Mary. Mary was blessed. She was a virgin. She but she, but you know what she wasn't? 
she was not sinless. And that's what they teach. She was, that she was sinless. That she was an ever, ever eternal virgin. Well, in Esther, we see this scripture here. And the king loved Esther. Esther, by the way, is, um, is a, a very uh, important book in a couple, uh, for a couple reasons. One, it shows the power that the queen would have having the, the crown upon her head. It also shows the power of a, a, um, uh, uh, a righteous king. The word of a righteous king. This is not a corrupt king in the book of Esther. This was a good man. This was a good king. And it shows that his, that he respected that once his words went out, there was no taking it back. If any, if that story tells us anything, and if you haven't had a chance to read that book, it's only about 10 chapters or maybe 12 or something, I'm not sure, but go ahead and get a chance to read that. But what it, what it shows us is that when a king, when a, a, an honest, righteous king speaks forth a word, there's no taking it back. And I want you to, when, when, when you read Esther and you realize the example set forth, I want you to understand there's a king up in heaven. There's a king we call God, the Father. And when he, as king of the universe, when he speaks, there's no taking it back. So when the word says you're healed, there's no taking it back. If God says you're healed and you believe you're healed, you're going to get your healing. But if God says you're healed and you don't, you don't believe it, or God uh, or the devil tricks you out of it or, or makes you stumble, then you lose faith in his word, and then you're off the solid ground, or you're, you're off the solid stand, if you will. What I want you to realize is the word of a king stands forever and there's no taking it back and that's what the whole story of esther is about but there's a verse here that says and the king loved esther above all the women and so she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and he made her queen instead of vashti uh he made her queen. Once she was made queen, she was queen, right? And when you're made queen, you have a certain amount of power and authority. Guess who he made queen? Who, there, there's another one that's been made queen. Anybody ever heard of the bride of Christ? The church, the bride of Christ has been made. He's not only his wife, but being the wife of the king... She has power and authority based upon the fact that she is the queen. Mary is not the queen of heaven. We're not to bow down and worship statues. It's been corrupted. The teaching's been corrupted and they've, they've, uh, they've uh, transformed or, or they've changed the word. The person who rightfully sits as queen is the church. And if you are a part of the church... That is the place of authority that you have. That doesn't mean you can uh, vaunt your authority over one another, but you certainly have authority over those demonic creatures and Satan himself. Notice also it said that he set the crown upon her head. He made her queen instead of Vashti. The word here in Hebrew, here's it in Hebrew, Vashti. But I want you to see that Vashti, the literal meaning is beautiful. She's beautiful. We have a couple constellations. There's actually 48 constellations in the heavens. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you that... Remember I said that there's a, there's a couple references, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, where it talks about the heavens being like a scroll. A scroll is like a book, Right? Well, what kind of a book could it be? I also sh showed that there's a scroll coming out of his hand when he, when he sits upon the throne and he hands the scroll to Jesus and he has the authority to open up that sealed book 
and it tells the it's like the it's like the key to the, all the rest of the prophecy. Well, those are two facts. And then Zechariah we showed that he saw this scroll, this great scroll when he was looking up in heaven. He didn't tell us exactly what it was, but he said it was the curse going throughout the whole earth. We talked about that could be the word of God. Another thing people have said was, you know, it could be um, that it was symbolic of the gospel being preached by way of satellite and by way of the airwaves throughout the whole earth. And it could be, and that symbolically could be, but I think it goes uh, further than that. Um, you, you don't know... Uh, enough of, about this yet so I'm just going to I'm, what I'm going to do here is before I talk about this slide I want to tell you uh, what, what these 48 constellations actually represent we know that Semiramis corrupted the, uh, the truth as it was in the beginning we know she brought in astrology we know that she corrupted the heavens with her teaching of ho uh, horoscopes we know that she mixed in this idolatry in the worship of goddesses and gods who were not gods and goddesses at all we know that the stars were never meant to bow down and serve the stars literally said in Genesis the stars were for seasons and times. And actually, that word seasons is not even the same word as our seasons. Because how many seasons do we have? Four, right? Actually, the, it literally said to the, the Hebrew, it said there were, these were the stars were put in place for the appointed times. And if you ask any Jew, that's, you know, that's in the word. They will tell you there are 70 appointed times according to the Bible. You say, wow, that's a lot of appointed times. Well, yes. And uh, one of those appointed times is the weekly Sabbath. So that's, um, there's 52 weeks in a year. So they're taking care of 52 of them right there, right? The rest of them are around those, uh, 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 fe festivals that we talked about, those, uh, feast days that we talked about before. There's two constellations here that are out there in space. And this one here is, uh, some say, I, I call it Cassiopeia, but, um, I think that maybe the pro, pro the proper pronunciation is Cassiopeia. I've heard it both ways. I don't know. I'm, I'm just in the habit of saying Cassiopeia. That's the way I learned it. So if, if it's, it's Cassiopeia, um, I mean the same thing. But the name, it's interesting. The name means the beautiful enthroned. We saw that from Esther's time that the queen that the, that the um, uh, Esther replaced... As queen, her name was Vashti, and Vashti meant beautiful, right? And here in this constellation, we actually have the, the meaning here is the queen of heaven. And she also happens to be the same one we'll see later that was bound in chains. Anybody ever heard of Andromeda? A constellation called Andromeda. It's a woman that's bound in chains, a prisoner. Well, this is the same woman who later sits upon the throne. Okay, but notice also there's a crown. Remember, we started talking about a crown with 12 stars. Well, let me leap over here. If the 12 stars actually represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and we said that it's very well known that in Israel, the 12 uh, sons of Jacob were actually had a, they all had a standard where they were associated with one constellation. For instance, the, the, uh, the tribe of Judah. Who knows what their sign was? The lion. lion of Judah. Well, we have a constellation out there called Leo, right? And, so, and the other 12 also had signs. Now, don't think that this has anything to do with astrology or horoscopes, or worshiping planets, or worshiping false gods, or mythology. All of that is a corruption. But one thing Semiramis and Nimrod did not make up, they did not make up these signs. It is believed that, um, that uh, the 
teaching and preaching of these, the meaning behind the heavens and the signs were originally from the prophet Enoch. I ever heard of the prophet Enoch? Enoch, before the time of the flood, was caught up to God, according to the Bible. Well, some of the, uh, it doesn't say in the Bible, but some of the other literature that goes along with the tradition of Enoch says he was caught up, came back down, preached after he got the revelation, and he preached to the world. And then uh, on his birthday, he was caught back up to heaven. And he was, I think, 360 years of life. 360 years old, and then he was caught up. The interesting thing about Enoch is he was born on the feast of um, the feast of Pentecost, and he also so he had his birthday on the feast of Pentecost, and so he also rose into heaven on the feast of Pentecost, which is kind of interesting because when was the church supposedly born? The feast of Pentecost, and the church is going to. Rise, um, and in yeah. So you could say uh, he. Few people that rules that they can't really count for, you know. Well, and we we do know. We talked last week about the ones that that rose with Christ, the first fruits, right? The Book of Revelation makes very clear that this crown is in jeopardy. Uh, remember, the crown upon the woman's head is the crown upon Christ, or the bride's head. Now, Satan cannot do anything to get the crown off the bride's head, and she can't lose that crown. Christ has firmly placed it on his bride. But what he can do, according to the scripture, look at this. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, and no man take your crown. You can, you can make a choice to allow Satan to get your crown by giving in, by letting him trip you up. You can allow, by, by not repenting, you can allow yourself to lose your part of that crown, your part of that place. But the, the bride of Christ herself cannot lose her crown, obviously, because one day she will sit According to this story in heaven, she will sit upon a throne. If you can imagine the 12 stars, we said the 12 stars represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one of the 12 tribes actually had one of the signs of the zodiac or the the, um, uh, standard of the zodiac. Uh, uh, that was associated with them. So if you can imagine that this crown is what was placed upon this woman's head. She's got 12 stars. And that this, what I'm about to propose is that when it talks about the, the, uh, the scroll in heaven, the, the heaven being like a scroll, and um, it talks about... Uh, uh, the uh, Ze- Zechariah saw that scroll uh, uh, going across the, the heavens, this gigantic scroll. I believe he was referring to this. I believe um, what, um, what these anciently represented was the whole gospel of Jesus Christ, the whole story of Christ, and also the judgment. In Jude, it talk, Jude says that um, uh, small epistle in the, right before Revelation says uh, that um, Enoch preached in his day before the flood of the coming of Jesus Christ and the judgment. But you don't have any record of it. Well, what did he preach? I believe that he, he was shown the meaning and he looked at the stars and, and as the stars moved to the next part and the next part, he, 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 he received the revelation from one to the next. Because what happens is <clears throat> every year the, uh, the sun traverses around see this uh, this line here it's like a circle it's called the ecliptic and this is the path that the sun always takes around and around and around that's why how many have ever uh, uh, asked you what your sign was well we're christians our sign is the cross we don't have a sign you know i mean if you want to get technical my sign is scorpio 
In fact, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the only evil signs. I hate the fact that I'm a Scorpio. Because everybody else has a good sign, but Scorpio is actually a negative sign. And that being said, how would you feel if you were one of the children of Israel, one of the 12 tribes, and they all were given a sign, and you were the one tribe that was given the evil sign? All the rest of them got good ones. Well, that's that, interesting that that tribe was the tribe of Dan. The sign was Scorpio. And do you know when it lists in the book of Revelation, when it lists the 12 tribes, when it numbers 144,000, do you know what tribe is missing? Dan. Dan is missing. And from the beginning of the church age, all the way for the last 2,000 years, men, prophets, preachers, uh, have taught that the, the Antichrist will come from the tribe of Dan based upon that scripture and that association. But if you can imagine that this, these, uh, remember this woman's clothed with the sun, right? The moon's under her feet. In other words, she's clothed with the, the brightest light that God ever made and all lesser light is under her feet. And the whole story of the, the stars is a crown upon her head. Well, that would be cool if it was true. But how do we know? Just because I say it doesn't make it true, right? In fact, some of you might be ready to throw stones at me right now. What are you doing here, right? So let's go to the scripture. I purposely spoke about the tabernacle when we were in Revelation chapter 4 because I wanted you to see the association as John gets in heaven and he stands before God's throne and we begin to see all the typology in the book of Revelation as it is associated back to the tabernacle that Moses built. Remember God said build everything according to the pattern. Psalm 19 Verse 1 through 6 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God. Wow. I mean, I, just to look up, I, I mean, I, I've had the privilege, not very often, but to be a way where you could actually look up in, in the sky and you could see just all these beautiful stars. Just tremendous, just tremendous glory and beauty, right? And that could be all it meant, but all it means, but I think it goes much deeper than that. Watch this. <clears throat> Heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, what do we do when we're as Christians, when we, we are witnesses? We declare the glory of God, right? In other words, when we preach the gospel, we are declaring the glory of God, aren't we? So the heavens also declare the glory of God, and the firmament, firmament is what? The heavens, right? If we go back to Genesis where the creation occurred, firmament was heaven. The firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. This scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of God through some type of speech and some type of knowledge. In other words, the heavens are talking to the people on the earth. And look at the next verse. There is no speech and no language where their voice is not heard. In other words, <clears throat> I wasn't there at the Tower of Babel. But if this existed, if this language existed before the Tower of Babel, then even though their languages were confused, this wouldn't have been touched. Right? The meaning wouldn't have been touched. And this is saying that Everywhere, everywhere that the uh, that this um, that the firmament and these stars can reach, which is all over the earth, right? There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Look at the next verse. Their line, remember the ecliptic. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. I spent a lot of time. Uh, several years actually researching some of this stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm uh, telling you tonight. 
And uh, I discovered that the ancient religions, they have something that, I mean, the real ancient ones have something in common. And that is that they all seem to have come from the worship of stars. And the association with these constellations and deities that they made up in the worship of these, you know, these gods like Hercules and, and Zeus and, and Isis and, you know, Sirius and you can use Venus. All, at one time, if I can paint this picture for you, at one time there was one God, everybody knew it. There was one truth, and everybody knew it. There was one message, and that was the message that this prophet Enoch preached. And we know from Jude's record that what he preached was Jesus, the Messiah, was coming, and so was judgment. And so he was preaching, actually, the second coming, of, or the, uh, the uh, advent of Jesus Christ to the earth. The changing of the languages wouldn't change anything because it, this, tran, this, this transcends the actual language. You've, you find out it doesn't matter what language people have, they still have their religious beliefs. And, it, and you can consolidate all these religions. They, they have this thing in common. They're all very similar. You can tell it has. When you get right down to the ancient origins, they all have a, cons, a, con, a, 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 a a similar origin, and it comes from this, uh, this zodiac, if you will. Let's read verse 4 again. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. Remember the glory of the tabernacle? How God said, make it all a pattern. Now, the, the Bible is telling us that God has set a tabernacle for the sun out there in the heavens. And that by way of this tabernacle, the heavens declare the glory of God throughout all of the earth. And there's not a place throughout the earth where their, their words have not gone. And from that, we have all these religions. And how, and how many people have heard this? Uh, people say, you know, all religions are basically the same. You know, they teach about good and evil. All lead to God. You know, and they all lead to God. Well, you know what? There's some truth to them. The problem is, it's been corrupt. All religions are corrupt. Just like the Catholic Church corrupted it when they took this association and made Mary something to be worshipped and put those 12 stars on her head because that wasn't the meaning of it. And so you don't know. They don't... All these religions, they don't know what they're worshiping. Remember Jesus met that woman at the well, and he said, we worship what we know. You worship what you do not know. But we worship what we know. Why? Because we worship based upon the word of God. What separates, what removes the, uh, the false religious teachings, the corrupt religious teachings, is when the word of God is placed in front of them. And now the word of God tells what those stars actually represented. Without the word of God, you, can't, you, you have no idea because it's been so corrupt by Semiramis and Tammuz and, and Nimrod. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting here, as we go along, we're going to see it. The gospel message is taught by way of this throughout all of the earth. So let's look here. Again, he goes further. He says, Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for this. And he equates this as the tabernacle. Then he says, Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. What is the gospel? It's about a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. That's what Jesus is. He's coming to take his bride. He rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Paul talks about running the race. Jesus came, run the race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. There is nothing hid from the heat thereof. I hope you can see that what he's talking about here 
is the heavens declaring this message to all of the earth. And as a result, the whole world is without excuse. Uh, so the... Uh, you can see here that we have the tabernacle. I didn't change the scripture up here. The scripture is the same. We don't need to read it. Just to remind you what the tabernacle represented. When you saw the tabernacle, see, nobody back then, when they saw the tabernacle, made the connection that this was talking about Christ, that this was talking about the, the gospel, and the association that this had with the, prof- the prophecy until the book of Revelation opened it up. The, um, the heavens are the same. See the tabernacle that God has placed for the sun. There are actually, now we, we're familiar with 12 signs, right? But there's actually 48 signs that tell the, the, that tell the story. When he's talking about the tabernacle for the sun, remember, this is the ecliptic and this is the sun follows a path and it never veers off the path. You've heard about, you know, astrology says, well, what house was the sun in? The, the sun was in the, the house of Aquarius, or the sun was in the house of Leo, and Mars was in the house of... Sun. Well, the planets also go through all these signs because they follow the sun, right? This, the planets are always, by gravity, held to the sun, and the sun always goes around, and it makes a complete circle throughout these signs once a year. So when it finishes, the year starts all over again, and we have a, uh, uh, another year. And the Bible actually says that the stars were put out there for these signs and the seasons. In the book of Romans, it says this, Talking about the whole world, and it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness or unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. What that scripture is saying, you know, you you could dis you could uh, disregard or or discard the Bible. You could discard the, the teaching of that Jesus came. You could discard um, uh, the church. You could discard. Um, you could discard everything that we know to be the truth, and yet the world would still be guilty before God because the Scripture is saying, "Look at here." It's not good. I mean, thank God we have all this revelation. We wouldn't know the truth if it wasn't for Christ. But look at this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. And how has he showed it to them? He showed it to them through creation. The very creation tells us that God exists. And mankind is without excuse when he refuses to worship God because of all the evidence that God has shown him in creation. He goes further. He says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Some people say, well... Well, what if, what if they never heard the gospel? According to this book of Romans, they're without excuse already. Even if they never heard. The gospel tells, us how, tells them how to get saved. But they ought to already know that they are a dirty, rotten sinner. They already ought to know that. Besides that, God gave, him, gave each one of us inside a conscience. That conscience actually will work and do its job unless you seared it. Unless you refuse to listen to it, and you finally uh, uh, gotten to the point where you can ignore it, verse twenty one says, "Because that when they knew God, so you can still, you could tell God's up there through creation. They knew God. They glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. How many know people that are that think that they're so wise, so smart?" but they don't need God, or they don't believe in God. There's a lot of atheists out there. They they don't think that they need God. They don't think God exists. They're lying. According to the scripture, they know there's a God. We just read it. In fact, there's two, two witnesses here. This scripture that we're looking at right now, 
It says that all of creation tells them that there's a God and they're without excuse. Then the other scripture we just looked at, he said that, that there's nowhere that hasn't been touched by the story the stars have told. And we know we got the story cor- somewhat correct because all these religions came out of it. And the people confess, even though they're not Christians. They say, well, all religions are basically the same. Talks about good and evil. Talks about judgment. All these religions talk about judgment and sin and, and uh, just uh, dishonoring what is uh, deity, right? And so they're without excuse. Whether they've heard the gospel or not, they're without excuse. This is uh, actually taken from in Israel. On the floors of synagogues in Israel, these are, pic- these are uh, engravings of the Zodiac in the floors of the synagogues from a- ancient synagogues. I don't know what to make of it, but it was there. And I'm just bringing that to your... Now, we know that they were 12 tribes were associated with the signs. We know they didn't... Wor- we know, for the most part, they didn't worship false deities, but they did know what, their, what place there was, uh, what, what sign, what standard they had. Did they ever date that? How old is this? Yeah, I, I don't know what the date would be. And, uh, and here, when we go to the next slide, we're going to see, you see this livid here? We're going to see, we're going to be able to see that better. You see there, that, that's Virgo. Okay, so that one shows up pretty good, Virgo, when you, when you um, magnify it. Now, we saw this picture when John came up to heaven. And I explained in a previous lesson, I explained some of these parts. I explained that we had a menorah, just like we did in the tabernacle. We had the seven uh, fires there, right there before the throne. We talked about the, these 12 uh, um, uh, showbread. And we said that they represent the, those 24 elders across um, on either side of the, on those thrones. Uh, the altar of incense from the tabernacle. Uh, we, we saw in, in another picture earlier how the, the uh, priests got down and they were offering incense and prayers to God. Uh, we see up here another picture from the tabernacle, how it was um, this is glorious place of worship. And you can see on the back, um, on the back drape there how it, they had the four cherubim up there, which are the same as these four cherubim here. And then, of course, on the throne itself, we placed the ark because in the in the ark of the tabernacle, the, the ark represented the throne of God, right? So we, cut, we 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 talked all about that association. Okay, so now watch this. Let's look at this tabernacle of the heavens. Okay, oh, oh you remember uh, you got the the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. Okay, just remember. Look at this at the four corners of the zodiac. You have the Lion of Judah. You see him up here. Okay, you see the Lion? You have the Ox, which is a Taurus the Bull up there. <clears throat> you have uh, Reuben, who is the man, who is Aquarius. <clears throat> and you have uh, the tribe of Dan, which is Aquila, the Eagle. But really, his sign was... Remember, his sign was the evil sign? Dan hated his sign so much that he changed the sign to an eagle with the serpent in his mouth and then eventually came to just think of it as the eagle because he didn't want to be associated with that sign. But yet, God still associated him with that sign because he's left out at 144,000, isn't he? He's an evil sign. I want to show you some connections here. <clears throat> You'll see uh, uh, Reuben, for instance, representing Aquarius. We see a scripture here uh, from Genesis 49, 2 through 4. Gather yourself together and hear ye, sons of Jacob, hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency, dignity, and the excellency of power, unstable as water. Many believe that this, that in fact, in this scripture in Genesis 49, uh, Jacob is blessing all 12 of his, his sons. 
and he is obviously connecting them with these signs. So Reuben uh, was connected with uh, Aquarius. Let's go to the next slide. The lion, let's look at this, Judah. Genesis 49, 8 through 9. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp. From thy prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion who shall rouse him up. You see the connection there? Okay, the, uh, the bull represented uh, Joseph. And Joseph had two sons, remember, Ephraim and Manasseh. So both horns were considered one son of Joseph. Watch this. His glory is like the firstling of a bullock. His horns are like the horns of unicorns. Well, unicorns only have one horn, but he has two, right? Two sons. And actually the word unicorn... A unicorn is a mythological creature. The word unicorn is not, even though it's in English in the Bible, it's, it's not what we think of as that mythological unicorn with one horn. The story is not true. Now, you heard about that song, Green Alligators and Long Neck Geese. And remember that? And, and the whole story was you're never going to see a unicorn. Why? Because Noah forgot to get one on the ark. Well, that's not true. They made that up. Unicorn is mythological, <clears throat> even though the English word appears in our Bible. Actually, if you look, if you see what the, what the Hebrew word was, it's actually a reem. A reem was not just a bull. It was a magnificent bull. And it was, it was incredibly large. And I believe uh, that it um, also was white in color. So it was like... It was like a majestic uh, creature. But when it says unicorn, it's actually the word reem. <clears throat> but it doesn't say that in the, in the translation. But anyway, so his glory is like the first thing of bullock. His horns are like the horns of unicorns or a reem. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth. And they are the ten thousands of Ephraim and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Okay, so you can see where they get their sign from. And Jacob's the one who named it on them, okay? Here's Dan. Watch this. See, Dan likes to be associated with the eagle. And you can see the eagle up here, but really, he's associated with, in, in, uh, depending on what zodiac you give, we're familiar with Scorpio. But actually, in like the Egyptian zodiac, I, be- I believe it might be a, uh, a serpent. But you can see a serpent or uh, uh, whether it's a serpent or a scorpion represented the evil one. Uh, the evil one's the evil one, no matter what, uh, uh, any way around it. But look at the scripture here. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent. By the way, an adder in the path that bites the horse's heels so that the rider shall fall backward. Now, who's the rider on the, on the white horse? Jesus, right? Jesus is the rider on the white horse. Revelation chapter 19, he comes to execute judgment. But the, the original prophecy given to Eve was that her seed... Would his heel would be hurt by the serpent, but he would crush the head of the serpent. We'll look at here. It says, Dan shall be the serpent that bites the horse's heel and makes the rider fall backwards. That's talking about the Messiah falling and dying, but rising from the dead. So you can, you can get an idea here of those, um, those four. Now, I, I want to, uh, <clears throat> rather than go through all the rest of the tribes, I, wanna, I want to uh, go through some uh, more, uh, what I think is a, a more significant. We can, end, we can go back to the other tribes later, but uh, let's look at some more slides here. Levi, Levi was a priest, right? Remember Levi was given the umum and the thumum. Okay, you remember that? The thumum, thumum and the urum. They were two stones of some sort, and nobody really knows exactly what they were, and they were able they communi- they were able to communicate to God with these stones. We really don't know how, but it is recorded in the Bible. <clears throat> they were able to, whenever you had 
uh, any disagreement with somebody, wherever you needed somebody to stand as a judge or a counselor, you would go to the priest. That's what the priests were there for. And they would judge. Well, look at Levi's symbol here is Libra, the scales of judgment. See, they would, they would weigh. And look what it says here. And of Levi, he said, Let thy thumim and thy urim be with thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst serve at the waters of Meribah. They shall teach Jacob thy judgments and Israel thy law. They shall put incense before thee and whole burnt sacrifice upon thine altar. So it does kind of make sense that, that Levi would have this symbol of Libra uh, so that they could judge the people. Of right and wrong. Let's go to the next slide. And of course, they were the custodians of the uh, of the law. Here's a scripture: um, Isaiah chapter seven, verse fourteen. Anybody rep, uh, recognize this? Therefore, the Lord Himself shall give you a sign: Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. Who knows what Emmanuel means? God's with us, right? There's one of the most fantastic prophecies that a virgin shall conceive. Do you know a lot of the church, by the way, uh, a lot of the pastors don't believe in a virgin birth anymore? If I have a pastor like that, run. run. Because you know what that tells me? He doesn't believe the word. If a pastor don't believe the word, you've got a problem. Because the the pastor's not going to teach the word if he doesn't believe the word. So why do you want to listen to the pastor if he doesn't believe the word, right? Well, here, one of the most prominent uh, constellations is Virgo. And actually, you can't tell right now, but there's a constellation right next to her, which is called Coma. And what that is, is Virgo sitting sitting on a chair with an infant in her lap. And that infant is said to be... Emmanuel, the Son of God, who's coming. Oh, actually, we're we're talking about that right here. Coma. You see it? It's upside down, but you so you gotta you gotta kind of turn it up here. But see, coma is is this woman sitting on the throne with a child in her lap. A child, and remember that scripture: a child is born. Here, Isaiah chapter nine, verse six: For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Is this tabernacle of the stars? Is this telling us the gospel? I think so. Look, we started with the Virgin. And now the virgin has conceived. She's given a a son. The scripture tells us this child is God with us. And that all, all of the ancient religions that are based upon the stars believe that this was the incarnation of God. See, the problem they have is in their identification of who God is. See, some call him Zeus, some call him Vishnu, uh, Brahma. <clears throat> Don't be pointing like that. But um, so uh, the problem is they they don't they know some of the truth. But they don't have the scripture. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the knowledge of the word. So they don't know who it rep- is actually talking about. Libra is judgment, right? For he cometh to judge the earth. Libra is all about judgment. Here's scripture. He cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, the people with his truth. Did you know even in ancient Egypt, you can see on the, on the, uh, 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 the papyrus and the, the writings on the, the, the pyramids, you can see paintings where they have a great big balance, a scale. In fact, they put the heart on one end of the scale, and they're weighing the heart. Your ancient religions talk about a judgment to come. Where did they get that idea? They all talk about a judgment. The Bible talks about a judgment too. But we know about the judgment. They only know what they've been taught. But you see the connection? They, they all teach the judgment to come. 
here we got, oh, look at this. This one's beautiful. Here we have a scripture here, which um, this, uh, this centaur, a centaur spoke of a being having two natures. He would have had a nature of a, uh, what was it? A, um, some, it could have been a horse, I don't know, and a man. If you've, if you've ever looked into the, uh, uh, um, mythology or anything. But I'll tell you, a, a centaur is, is not so far off if you read Revelation chapter 9 and you find out that the locusts that come out of the bottomless pit actually are centaurs, if you read that very carefully. It, it, <clears throat> there was a time where uh, before the days of Noah that the fallen angels were, were playing around with genetics and they produced all these giants uh, upon the earth. And we don't have to really get into that much. But we don't know what kind of creatures were on the earth at that time. Some have even suggested that it's very interesting that uh, the word dinosaur is actually comes from the word terrible lizard. You speak about dinosaurs and you see all these great big creatures, giants, right? Why were they here? Why, why aren't they here anymore? They might have been a result of reptilians uh, genetically uh, uh, playing with the genetics. I don't know. But um, anyway, this represents, it's, the sign has represented two natures, and the Messiah had two natures, right? The Bible teaches this Messiah would have two natures, but look at right under this person, there's a constellation called Crux. And there, that is a cross. And this represents the sacrifice. You see, you see how the spear is going into the victim, which is called lepus. It, it actually, uh, the Greeks changed it to a wolf, but it was actually supposed to be a lamb. And you can tell that it represents Messiah to be crucified or nailed to the cross. And we have this scripture here. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So what have we talked about so far? The story told us that there would be a virgin that would conceive. He would bring back, bring forth a child. And that child would be God with us, an incarnate God. There would be a scale in the, in the dead and everyone would be judged. There would be right next to the scale what is the other judgment right next to the scale here is the sacrifice who is a, on, a, on a tree or on a cross. Isn't that interesting? On the, uh, in the Egyptian zodiac, the scale is more like a, a, a balance. And on the middle of the balance sits a person. And the person is the same identical person that was in the lap of Virgo, sitting on the scales. In other words, he was the one who was judged <clears throat> for mankind. Scorpio is the accuser of the brethren. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, 10. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuse them uh, before our God day and night. Um, you, in this scripture, uh, comes from Revelation twelve ten. Of course, that's a, a, uh, talking about Drake, uh, the dragon, right? The accuser of the brethren who is cast down. So you can see that that's an evil sign and it represents Satan himself. Uh, it also says that his tail drew the third part of the stars. You could see also that um, the tail of the scorpion is actually knocking the altar down. He's knocking it over, causing the coals, the fire of judgment to come down towards the earth. You see that? That's the judgment. And that corresponds with Revelation 12.4. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Ophicius is this uh, man who's wrestling the serpent. Do you see the serpent? And the, the, the man is wrestling him. We have a scripture to tie it together. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ophicius is actually the good guy. He's actually the same guy who was the child now grown up the child that was in the lap of Virgo, he's the same one, but he's wrestling the serpent. I don't know if you can tell, but the serpent, if you follow the serpent's head, you can see him going up after the crown. You see that? All the way at the top here, 
You see the crown. And that brings in corona. Remember, we talked about the significance of corona. The, the woman was crowned as basically as queen. She had the 12 stars upon her head. They were made as a crown. That signifies that the crown that was in dispute, the reason that strong man was fighting the serpent, it wasn't his crown he was trying to protect. It was yours. And Psalm 8, 5 says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor. It's not talking about Messiah there. It's talking about man. Talking about Adam or mankind. <clears throat> Here's another uh, picture. You can, you can see literally uh, is blown up and you can see as a serpent is trying to take your crown. And the only thing preventing the serpent from getting your crown is a strong man who's holding them back. You can't do anything about it. You're completely vulnerable, except for the strong man is on your side. And we hear in Revelation chapter 3, 11, Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast, or hold fast which thou hast, that no man takes thy crown. We can see here Sagittarius. Sagittarius has the bow. And it says in the scripture, thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby the people fall under thee. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is the right scepter. You can see where see it says that thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemy. When Sagittarius shoots his bow, his arrow goes straight into the heart of the enemy who is Scorpio. So you see that it's telling the same, it's telling the story, the gospel story. Let's go to the next slide. Again, the, the altar here, the angel in Revelation 8, 4, 5, and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. There were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Uh, here's Capricorn. Capricorn's interesting. It's a, it's a uh, goat. Right, but it, it's not just a goat. It's got a, it's got a, the tail of a fish. Okay, in the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice was the goat, but there were two of them. One was the blood that would atone for the sins through the death of that goat. The other one was the one that they p- pronounced curses upon and all the sins, and then they led him to a cliff so he'd fall over the cliff and die. But Jesus, he was the goat, the the goat of atonement, right? And he died for our sins. He is the blood of the uh, the day of atonement. But the fish tail represented life springing forth from the death, from the dead, if you will. Um, It's interesting that this sign is called Hupinius, uh, which means the place of the sacrifice uh, in Egypt. Uh, here's Capricorn again. Within the scriptures, two goats are chosen as a sacrifice for the day of atonement. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So you can see where that comes from. Uh, you can notice there that you got the goat, but his tail is in the uh, ends up, or its, its hinder part is a fish. Well, does that speak of Christ at all? Oh, remember this symbol? In the, in the early church, they began to associate Christ with this symbol. The reason they did is because you can see there's, they, it made up uh, five Greek words. The first one was Asus. Who, who knows what Asus is? Jesus, right? Asus. Uh, the other one was Christos. The other one was Theos, that's God. So you got Jesus Christ, God. Uh, Euios was the son or the son of God. So you got Jesus Christ, son of God, and Soter was the final word, and that meant salvation. So the, the sign to the early church meant salvation. Uh, the salvation comes only through the son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what that sign meant. Of course, Christians knew that. Uh, see, it's here. It translates as Jesus Christ, Son of God, 
Savior. Uh, During the early days of Christianity, Christians were often put to death for practicing their faith, so they worshipped in secret places. A fish painted on the outside door of a house let other Christians know that they would be safe and welcome inside. The Christian fish symbol is now often used to identify Christians and or Christian businesses. We still use it today. It's as ancient as almost a cross itself. Uh, you have the, the, the symbol Aquarius. You can see Aquarius was what? He's pouring forth the water, right? Well, look at this. It equates to Second uh, Peter. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and the thousand years is one day. The important part here is the water coming out of uh, Aquarius here represents that the world back then in the time of Noah perished by the flooding. Well, here's something interesting that I discovered. The book of Genesis doesn't just talk about one flood. It actually talks about two floods. See, we had the flood of Noah, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And did you know the whole earth was covered in water? And I don't have time to get into it tonight, but if we had time, I could show you where... If you put some of the prophecies together, you'll find out that the first earth was created perfect. And that's where Satan led his rebellion. There was when judgment came, Satan was destroyed, his kingdom was destroyed, and the earth perished. But nobody survived. Then God took, he said, let there be light. And another earth came, and that's when Adam came into the picture. And then eventually you had Noah, and that earth was destroyed. Now, this constellation only speaks about one flood. There's one urn. But in the Egyptian zodiac, which is actually older, Aquarius is standing there. It's, un- it's unbelievable. He's got two urns, and there's two floods coming. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, my. You know, it was like, how would anybody know? How, I mean, most, most preachers don't know what I'm talking about. And here, it was there from the beginning. Let's go to the next slide. We're still still in Peter. And he spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Look at this. Anciently, this fish represented the incarnation of God who warns man of the flood and instruction to the building of the ship to escape the floods of destruction. The two fish to follow, Pisces, are said to be the offspring of this uh, Pisces Australis. This fish, this big fish that drink, that is a, a receiver of the waters of Aquarius, this actually anciently re- represented Noah and the eight people that were saved through the flood. So if you, if you go and you study the history, you'll find out that that did represent Noah and those eight people who came through the flood. And of course, the, the other fish would represent their offspring. Here's Pisces, the other two fish right here. These are the offspring of that other fish. And we have a scripture here. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them. The name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth that they may grow. And then here's a, here's another translation of the, of the same verse. Notice here, this is Geneva Bible. It was translated as, uh, like this, instead of the multitude, it says that they may grow as fish into a multitude in the midst of the earth. The, the um, Uh, fish were always a sign of being fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. How many have had, uh, uh, ever had like an aquarium of guppies? If you get a male and female guppies, pretty soon you got a bunch of guppies. Right? And you just keep, they just keep breeding over and over. Because fish is a sign of, of multitudes and multitudes. It's interesting that anciently, the uh, constellation Pisces, you can look this up, uh, the uh, constellation Pisces represented Israel and the two, the two, uh, uh, the two uh, nations of Israel. Uh, the famous Jewish commentator Arbino, or Ar, a barbano, 
affirms in his writings on Daniel that this astrological sign of Pisces has always been representative of the nation Israel. You see they're connected by a band here, by the way. We'll talk about that in a minute. That's actually, the band is actually separate from the other constellation. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, Speaking of, the, of Pisces, you'll notice that one fish follows the ecliptic path. Remember, it's the path of the sun. You can see this one here. You see how he goes towards the he goes towards that sun, while the other one goes in a different direction. Uh, so the, the fish follows the ecliptic path, which is obvious by its alignment, but also intercepts Pegasus, which implies how he rides the flying white stallion into the heavens. What we're talking about, you see how this fish inter, intercepts Pegasus? And it was said anciently that that fish rides up the the um, uh, the white on the, on the white stallion. If you're familiar at all with the uh, mythology of Perseus, remember Perseus rode upon the um, uh, Pegasus. <clears throat> the second fish intercepts Andromeda. See, this is Andromeda. Remember, I talk about the chained woman. The church is represented as the chained woman. And only God can free her from those chains. You'll see that the second fish inter, intercepts Andromeda, which is the chained bride. Um, over here is Perseus. Perseus is the constellation called Perseus. In the mythological account, remember, it's, it's him who, who cuts off the head of Medusa. Remember Medusa? Did you know the, the head of Medusa is actually called Satan? The actual name for that head is Satan. So it's a head of Satan, if you will. But um, So he represents a changed woman savior whom she marries. Perseus is known to be the rider on the white horse, the God-man, if you will. When when uh, this deliverer, forget about the names. We're not we're not we we're not trying to bring up these as you know the these persons in mythology that they're anything. It's the con- constellation that has meaning. The meaning is intended here is that the woman, the bride, is bound, and only by the coming of her deliverer, who cuts off the head of Satan. He will deliver the chained woman. And you see Cassiopeia is right up here. She actually ends up then sitting upon the throne. Right next to her is uh, Cepheus, which is the king that sits in, um, in, the, uh, in the heavens there right next to her. And she sits on his, uh, on his side there on another throne. Let's go to the next slide. Um, the band... This band here that connects the two fish is said to be the eternal covenant between the binding of them together. But the, the, the band is also binds them to something else. It binds them to this constellation here. Well, let, let's see here. The band also represents the chain that binds the two to the monster who rises out of the sea. Revelation chapter 13, you know what you have? You have this monster rising up out of the sea. <clears throat> Also, his uh, paws, if you will, are on another constellation, which is water, represents a river of water. So he's coming out of the sea. Uh, Here's the scripture. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Upon his head, ten horns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. This beast, even though it's drawn like this, um, in um, in many places it was ancient, anciently thought of, of having, as a beast having seven heads. If anything, you can see that a lot of this typology, a lot of these pictures are in the book of Revelation as symbols, aren't they? You can see how these two fish are ba- banded together to each other, but they're both banded to the monster. You see that? In the tribulation period, the nation Israel will be in covenant, will be found in covenant with the Antichrist. And the Antichrist will destroy two-thirds of Israel as a result. When he breaks that covenant during the middle of the tribulation, he comes in there, he's going to kill two-thirds of them. Okay, so what we have here is starting at Virgo. um, I'll just show you what it looks like here. Here's Virgo in the center. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so 
Virgo is the promised seed of the woman. The constellations tell a story. There's 12 major signs, and each sign has three deacon signs associated with them. Three plus one makes four, and so each each one of those has it makes like forms a little book or story. So let's let's look at these signs together. The the uh, Virgo has her deacons. Let's see what they are. You see coma the the coma with the child in her lap. That's a, that's one of her deacons. So the Virgin has a child. And that you see the child sitting in her lap. And we talked about him before, the despised sin offering. And here you have boots. He's a man with a sickle in his hand. Do you remember in the Revelation, there's there's a man sitting on a cloud with a sickle in his hand to reap? But this man who comes out is said to be the same child that was in her lap. And you can't tell right now, but this little loop here, that's that dragon that's going for the crown. Or that serpent. He's coming after that serpent with a sickle in his hand. That's supposed to represent Messiah, according to the story in the heavens. And in the name Boots actually means the coming one. By the way, incidentally, I'm giving you like a real short synopsis of this. I could actually teach on this for 20 weeks. The names of the stars are absolutely incredible. They all speak of the things I'm talking about into much, much, much more depth. But I'm not um, going to uh, get into all that depth because we want to move on to, uh, to f- get through Revelation before the rapture happens. <clears throat> and then, so the next slide, right after Virgo comes Libra. We talked a little bit about Libra. That's the balances. Libra is balanced. I mean, means the meaning of the sign is balanced by the price which covers. Remember, I talked about the child being that price which co- actually covered. The next uh, next one, Deacon, associated with the scales, is the crown. You got the judgment, then the next deacon is the crown. Oh, here you can see, you see Boots now? You see how he's coming to protect the crown against the serpent? Over here, is the, the man is, is wrestling with the serpent trying to get the crown. Over here, he's attacking the serpent trying to get the crown. So he's coming from both ends. But it's the same person, really, according to the story. Because even though in mythology, they made up, these religions, they made up many gods... There weren't many gods. The story is always talking about the enemy, the bride, and the son of God. That's what the whole pageant of this, the whole story is talking about. In the tabernacle of the son, if you will. Let's go to the next next slide. Um, The next one was uh, lupus, the victim or the victim slain. Remember I said here it looks like a wolf, but it was originally a lamb. Um, again, you don't see it, but when he's speared, there's actually an altar over here, which this, uh, this individual is taking the sacrifice and laying it on the altar. You'll probably see it in another picture um, that'll come up. But. Uh, and of course, the last, uh, the last deacon was actually this, this cross. We already talked about it. Next slide. Oh, okay, and so now you have the Redeemer's conflict, which is Scorpio. We said that this represented the enemy, right? You notice also, by the way, the stinger. You see where the stinger is going to hit? You see the stinger is going to hit his heel? The name of the star actually talks about that wounding in the heel. And also, his other foot is crushing the heart. That Sir Scorpion's heart is right here. And he's, cr- he's, he's, he's uh, crushing the, the life out of the, the um, uh, Messiah is crushing the life out of the scorpion. Let's go to the next slide. And you can see that uh, o- Ophicius and Serpents is, both of those constellations are deacons of Scorpio, which helped tell the whole story of the, the struggle with the enemy. And then the, uh, the last deacon is Hercules. Now, I'm sure we've all heard about Hercules and the stories that have been on TV and movies and mythology and that. How many have heard of the 12, the 12 labors of Hercules from mythology? If you've ever taken a, mer- a mythology class or something, or you might have seen a movie, The 12 Labors of Hercules. Did you know? You probably didn't, but I'm going to tell you. I looked, at, I looked into that. The 12 labors 
of Hercules actually are, uh, oh, they're almost like parables. And each labor talks about one of the things that Jesus accomplished in the Gospels. It's just amazing. But of course, we won't see it here. Uh, you can see, though, that this, once again, it represents the Messiah, the mighty one to come. We all know Hercules was the son of God, right, in, in the mythology. Notice where his head is? Crushing the head of the serpent. See, you, you thought that all these things were just drawn up, but they're not. They have all this meaning that, that was intended behind all these pictures and even the rest of the world, the astrologers and the horoscopers and all, all these false religions, they don't even know what, what, it, what it represents. We know what it represents because we have the truth. And so when we apply the truth to these pictures, we, we see this, this um, wonder and amazement. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Which brings us to the next sign, which is Sagittarius. We talk a little bit about, about him. The arrow goes into the heart. Oh, here you can see the altar. This was the altar I was talking about where the sacrifice was going to be laid, but the tail knocked over the altar. <clears throat> and the altar is one of these. And uh, it says, uh, uh, Ara, the altar, consuming fire prepared for his enemies. And the fire is tipped over, and the, the coals of the fire come crashing down upon the earth. What, what might that uh, uh, speak to? How about the trumpets and the revelation where all these, all these uh, uh, meteorites and stuff come down upon the earth? Draco, which is the, uh, the other deacon constellation, the old serpent, the devil cast down from heaven. This is dra- the dragon, Draco. And again, Hercules' foot is uh, crushing the head of the dragon. Uh, here's Lyra. Lyra is a harp. Um, if you could, if you could see it, they, it actually has a harp, like a, a uh, has a strings there, but it's actually um, an eagle as well that has a, in a form of a, a like a harp. And we saw all the elders having the harp. The harp is um, speaks about the praise prepared for the conqueror. Again. Just by saying these, uh, mentioning these these labels, if you saw the meaning of the stars, of the individual stars within constellation, you would see how it talks to what I'm telling you. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you have, um, next one, you have Capricorn, the sea goat, which was the goat of atonement slain for the redeemed. Um, you had also a deacon, which was uh, Sajita, which is the arrow. You see the arrow? That which just missed the eagle. You see how it causes the eagle to fall? Remember, Dan, Dan stole the eagle as his sign. Remember? Because he didn't want to be uh, uh, regarded as the evil one. So you can see the, the, e- the aquila, the eagle, and one of the major stars uh, actually literally calls him the smitten one falling. So he's falling, plunging to his death. Uh, Delphinus is the dolphin, just like a dolphin. We've all seen the dolphins jump out of the water. They've always been representative of resurrection. And it's interesting, the eagle, the arrow is shot at the eagle. The eagle falls to its death. And then the next sign talks about a resurrection from the dead. Also, remember, the same tail that's on the goat is on uh, the the, um, the dolphin there. And you have Aquarius. We spoke about Aquarius, uh, the, the bearer of the living waters, blessing poured forth for the redeemed. Next slide. You had, I already talked about uh, Pisces Australis. Uh, the meaning there is the blessings bestowed upon. The next slide. Or the benefactor. Uh, Pegasus was one. The blessings coming quickly. The rider on the horse. Well, who's the rider on the horse? The, the white horse coming from Revelation chapter 9. That's just Jesus, right? King of kings, Lord of lords. Uh, Cygnus the swan. Uh, the blesser surely returning is literally what the, what the meaning of the stars says. What that talks about is the second coming of Jesus Christ. We've all heard the story of the ugly duckling who then became a swan, right? A beautiful swan. Remember, Jesus is actually the ugly duckling. Jesus, nobody accepted Jesus for who he was. They despised him. They killed him. 
but he becomes the most glorious, majestic, most beautiful person. Uh, we talked about Pisces. I got both of the fishes um, uh, circled. This represented Israel, and it's the blessings of the redeemed. Here you had the band. Remember, I talked about the band is what bound them together and bound them also to this, mon- this sea monster, the enemy. Here you had Andromeda, the chained woman, uh, the redeemed in their bondage and affliction. That's a perfect illustration of where the church sits and it's bound and it needs, it needs a savior, right? You see this, uh, this one fish that represents Israel going in and being her deliverer. Uh, you have uh, Cephas, who's the crown king, the, the king that's coming to rule. We know that Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, right? Right next to him, by the way, remember we mentioned Cassiopeia, who is that same Andromeda, now has a crown upon her head sitting upon a throne, which is, which represents, if this represents Jesus, this represents his bride, uh, here you've got Ares. Ares, we all know uh, it all. St- the sacrifice all started with Abraham. Remember Abraham, and there was a there was a ram with the uh, caught in the thicket. Remember that. Uh, here you have the ram or lamb. Uh, some people think it's a lamb. Blessings of the redeemed, consummated and enjoyed. It's the, it's the sacrifice of the covenant that started it all. Um, then part of his deacons is actually Cetus. The sea monster. Now, watch this. This is something you wouldn't expect to find. Remember, we talked about the fish. We talked about how the band bound them together. Now, watch this. This is something you wouldn't expect to find. Remember, we talked about the fish. We talked about how the band bound them together. They're bound to the monster. But look who breaks the bands. Look at the, look at the ram. He takes his leg and he snaps the band and sets the fish free from the monster. You see that? See it right there? Again, I didn't draw this. This this has been around for thousands of years. Some say that this is older than any any writing known to man. That that these pictures are older because this is is what existed in the previous earth. Uh, And I believe that this is what uh, Enoch preached about. Uh, here's uh, another deacon is Perseus. We talked about him. He represents the Savior who comes and saves the woman. And he's also Cephas who, who, who becomes king and, and Andromeda becomes his bride and queen of heaven. Just like Esther was made queen of heaven with the crown set upon her head. Remember this, uh, this head of Medusa was actually called uh, Satan which literally is the adversary and the demon's seed, represented the demon's seed. Uh, here you got the woman sitting on the throne. Now we, got, we come to the bull, Taurus. Remember we spoke last a couple of weeks ago about in the center is the Pleiades, and it's like Jesus standing in the center of the menorah. Remember we, t- we spoke about that? And in mythology, by the way, um, the uh, the bride is carried to safety right there on the neck of the bull. She puts her arms around the neck of the bull, and he carries her to uh, to safety in the myths. But um, the bride in the myth would rep- be on the neck here. The Pleiades also represents the seven churches, which is the bride. So you can see a parallel there. Um, uh, here you have Orion. Here's something interesting, Orion. Orion is the most glorious and brightest constellation of all the constellations. <clears throat> now, Orion was, by all the, all the pagans, used to uh, uh, equate Orion with the, this, the, the coming son of God who would come and, uh, and basically save the world. But there was one teaching of Orion because there was uh, the, uh, the people would ask, well, how would we know when he comes who Orion really is? Because anybody can come and say they're Orion, right? This was the promised Savior coming. So they said, they used to teach this. 
based upon the stars, they used to say, you will be able to recognize Orion because he, get, he has one ability that no other has never been given to any other man. You know what the, that ability was? It's right there in the stars. He will come walking on the water. You see him walking on the water? What's interesting is in the Bible, it doesn't say anything about Messiah coming, revealing himself, walking on the water. But the Greeks expected their Messiah to come walking on the water. And I believe that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy to say, hey, you guys, I'm the Messiah you're seeking for. He was not only, see, we got we to gotta realize the reason this is important, it's not because we get salvation through this. We have our Bible, but the rest of the world don't have the Bible. The, but this, what they have, their religions are based upon this, and this teaches that Jesus is the one. So Orion is walking on the water. And you see that his path, is, if he follows his path, he's, he's going to confront the, the monster, isn't he? Um, Eridanus is the river, and it's, it's actually called the river of wrath, breaking forth uh, for his enemies. In fact, this, in mythology, this water uh, actually becomes a lake of fire, and the monster would be plunged into it. Um, it's also, the, you have the deacon um, Origa, which is the shepherd, and it stands for safety for the redeemed in the day of wrath. So you can tell the shepherd has two goats in his arms. You see, he scoops them up and he holds them while he confronts the enemy and destroys the enemy, which was a threat to them. So they are in safety and embraced by the, the, the good shepherd uh, of the pasture. Next slide. Um, then you have the constellation of uh, Gemini, which represented the blood covenant. Jesus came to make a covenant. Actually, in mythology, what this was, was you had one immortal brother and you had another mortal brother. And what happened was the mortal brother died. And of course, everyone who died went down into Hades in mythology, but the immortal brother never died. Well, they were bound together in this covenant. They loved each other so much that the immortal brother said, he, he asked the, the God of gods, he said, I, can you take my brother, give me this one thing, let my brother come to live up here with me because I can't stand to be without him. That's how much the, the bond was. Blood covenant bond was a very similar to a marriage covenant. And, uh, uh, of course, the God of gods in the mythology said, no, we can't do that. Your brother is mortal. He must stay in Hades. And so this immortal one, uh, the other, the other bro uh, brother in the covenant said, okay, well, if he can't be with me eternally, then I will be with him. And he descended into hell on his behalf to be with him. But when the God of God saw the price that this brother, the immortal one, was willing to, to spend his time in Hades with his brother because he didn't want to be separate, he, he raised them both from Hades and placed them up into heavens. That's the gospel. Jesus descended to save the one that he could not bear to lose in the fires of hell. So he went down and was willing to become and take our place in Hades. And that's all that God was asking. And the price was paid and we ascend back into heaven uh, with Christ. Now, <clears throat> um, the, the, uh, the symbol lepus which is interesting, Lepus here, it's actually a rabbit. And it, it, there's no question about it, Lepus is an evil sign. If you, if you study these, the meaning of these things and the meaning of the stars, Lepus is very evil, and it's a rabbit. You'll notice that the 
um, the, the, the son of God, the one who represents the Messiah here, the one walking on the water, his foot is raised up. He's about to crush the enemy's head. You see that? In fact, the star here talks about um, crushing the head of the enemy. He's the enemy. What's interesting here is what do we, what has, what, what, we used to have Passover. What do we have now? We have Easter and we have a rabbit. And here's the rabbit as far as the constellation, because the rabbit is the symbol of the enemy, which the uh, Messiah will come and crush his head. <clears throat> uh, Canis Major was, uh, was a witness. Um, he was called the prince of the, um, I, I believe he was the prince of the constellations, but there's, there's two dogs. They're called the two witnesses. It's kind of interesting. Here's the one witness. There's Canis Minor up there, two witnesses. And they're, I believe, uh, they're right next to uh, Cancer. We'll see it in a minute. Cancer, if you'll remember, we talked about being the, the uh, paradise where all those who, who die in Christ are going, or all those uh, who die and go to paradise actually ascend up into that constellation represented by, by um, Cancer. But Canis is, uh, represents one witness. And uh, yeah, here's Cancer. See, can- uh, Cancer is, uh, on, is the next slide. And uh, it says, The Messiah's redeemed possession held fast. Remember we talked about, I don't know if we were, we're here to see where the lion protected the doorway into what we said. Eventually we concluded that this represented the new Jerusalem in heaven. Actually, there's two, um, there's, well, we'll talk about these in a minute. You'll see on the slide, but you got Ursa Minor and Ursa Major. These were two groups of redeemed people. Now, we, we spoke of the 24 elders last week as being the first group of redeemed. Guess how many stars are in the Ursa Minor? 24. And it represents the first, and it, and it also represents the one, look at these deflecting the dragging up there to, uh, to help, uh, help to save the greater one. But both of them will eventually dwell in this place, according to uh, the meaning of these constellations. So there you got Ursa Minor. You see Draco, how he's, he's attacking Draco. And then you, then you have Ursa uh, Major, which is the fold, and the, the great bear, which is the, the fold and the flock. Now, it's, it's kind of ridiculous to think of these as bears. Actually, it came from Greek mythology, the association with the bear. Whoever saw a bear with a tail like that? That is actually the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper anyway. But uh, just so you, I mean, you can obviously tell that the original pictures were not bears because they would have had a little tail if they were supposed to represent bears, right? Here's a ship. How many heard of Jason and the Argonauts? Very similar to Hercules and the 12 labors of Hercules. Jason also had these labors that he had to do, these journeys. And... I went through those, and they speak about the, God, the, the all those things that the journeys of Jason have uh, fulfill a pattern with the Gospels. But this Argo, this is cool. This uh, <clears throat> this ship is the ship they take the redeemed get in this ship, take their journey to the New Jerusalem, which is Cancer. Is that cool? Now I'm not saying that a UFO is going to pick us up. But if it did, it would be written in the stars. We don't need a UFO. Jesus is going to do a shout and we're going to rise to meet him in the air, right? But from long ago, this, this, um, the, the, uh, this map of the stars is at least, uh, at least uh, 4,000 years old and probably as existed before the time of the flood. But when they date it, they can only, they can only go back so far. And they date it to like 2000 BC plus the 2000 AD. Yeah, they have them together. It's like over 4,000 years. But this is the oldest. If this is a book, remember we started out talking the scroll of heaven. If this is a book, it's the oldest book ever recorded. It's the oldest book we have. Remember we talked about Ursa Minor, the big bear, uh, Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. This is what it actually, what the symbols actually represented. Here you have cancer. 
uh, it wasn't a crab. It was actually this building uh, where, where the redeemed were kept. Here you had a sheepfold, which was Ursa Minor, which also represented the 24 elders. And you can see the, land, uh, the sheep inside there. And here you have a shepherd with all his sheep. And that's what those, the constellations, those constellations actually uh, represent, uh, represented it before they turned them into um, bears. And uh, interesting that the scripture says, see, because this was the sign of Issachar, which was one of, one of the, uh, the, the sons of Jacob. Issachar is a strong ass couching between two burdens. And so you see, here's Issachar with big cancer, and he's, he's between the two burdens. Um, which are the burdens are the uh, the redeemed, and he saw that rest was good. Well, what is rest? Rest is that holy city and the land that it was pleasant. And the last slide is the sign of Leo. We talked about Leo being associated with uh, the line of Judah. Of course, it's, uh, the stars actually speak about Messiah's consummated triumph. There's Leo. We said in the previous lesson that he was protecting the doorway uh, uh, that led into the New Jerusalem, which is cancer. And you can see the enemy as the enemy is trying to get at the people, the inhabitants that are living their dwelling safe in the rest, which is in cancer. Another deacon uh, constellation is Hydra himself. So Hydra is the old serpent. Now, it's not just his head. It starts here. It's the, it's the largest constellation in the whole heaven. It starts here. It goes all the way. Look, it even extends way out here. In fact, remember the scripture says that when Satan is thrown down to hell, that he, a third of the stars go with him. If you took this, this serpent and you tossed him out of heaven, he's so big, he actually spans a third of that circle, and he would knock a third of the stars as he fell out of heaven. You tell me that, I mean, just think about it. Is John, does John write his symbolism talking about this? I think so. And this is why John was able to, to, to get this book off of the island of Patmos. They did not know what John was talking about. They thought he was talking about the same type of mythology that you know they already believed in, that they already allowed in the empire. They didn't know this was Christianity. <clears throat> the, the other deacon is crater. This is the cup of divine wrath poured out. It's interesting that in the book of Revelation, who rides on the beast? The woman, Babylon the Great, and she's holding up a cup. And that's what we have here. We have a cup that's resting on the, uh, the middle uh, or the back of the serpent. What's interesting here is when I, when I studied this out years ago, I compared also the uh, Egyptian zodiac, which is which is a lot different because, you know, it's Egyptian. But on the back of the serpent is a woman holding up a cup instead of the crater, just like in the book of Revelation, which is pretty cool. And um, so you can tell the symbolism is, is what it is. And then the next, the next deacon is Corvus. Oh, see, see how the tail now spans? You see, you got the whole thing here. You see how, you see how it takes like almost a third of the stars with it? Um, here's uh, Corvus the crow. And it's a, it comes and it's pecking at the serpent. It's, it's, it's actually attacking the serpent. God talks about, in, in Revelation chapter 14, he talks about the birds coming and feasting off the carcasses. And that will be one of the final judgments. Remember, during Armageddon, where all the, the, the carcasses are, uh, are there uh, upon the ground. Also, the, uh, the, the raven... What it represents, a raven was evil, dove was good. Remember the symbolism? Um, what we have here, I just, I'm not going to read all this, but I, I want to, I'm going to put it on the video. So let's go through these one by time. Here, here, here's a, the, Pisces is a sign of Simeon. Let's go to the next one. Um, Zebulun was the sign of Virgo. And you can read, you know, you can read this uh, on YouTube if you want to later. Let's go to the next slide. Issachar. 
uh, was the uh, one we just talked about was cancer. So we already talked about that. Next slide. There's this car again. We saw that slide. Next slide. Uh, Gad, uh, Asher, uh, let Asher be blessed with children. Let them be acceptable to his brethren. Asher was um, a Sagittarius. And Naphtali was uh, Capricorn. Benjamin was um, uh, the uh, Gemini. Uh, we saw that already. Next slide. Uh, there's the whole whole thing again. You can see here's here's that serpent. Now you can you can really see. You see how it, it starts up there. It comes all the way down here. You can see if this serpent was thrown out of the heavens, how it would knock over a third of the stars, just like the Book of Revelation records. Next slide. And we saw this uh, in the beginning where we talked. I'm going to read it again. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run the race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. 